صحبه ومن استنى بسنته ومن اكتفى بهديه الى يوم الدين اللهم لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Is everyone awake? Or is it too early? Are you not happy to be here on the weekend? Is that what's going on? I'm going to try one more time. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. That shows me at least you're awake. Yeah. So uh, the topic we have for today is the topic of the Sunnah of the Prophet and the issue of trends or following trends. And I actually uh, I found this an excellent topic. It was a wonderful topic because one of the things that we see now is how things uh, become trends very quickly. And it, ha it almost happens overnight, it happens very unexpectedly. So sometimes we'll see like a video on YouTube or something that we would never expect in our wildest dreams that something this ridiculous or idiotic would become viral, but it catches on and it becomes, uh, it becomes viral. Everybody starts watching it, talking about it, etc., etc. Now, we as human beings, uh, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us, we have the need to be part of something. We have the need to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We have the need to be part of communities and, and follow others and do things together. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because He is our creator, this is something that He already recognizes, obviously. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, throughout history, has sent prophets. Because Allah knows that for order, for, in order for us to be content, we have to have a leader. We have to have someone to look up to and someone to follow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala picked the best way to spread the message of Islam. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala picked sending messengers and sending prophets. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent to us. Now the question comes up, obviously the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not here with us today. Right? So how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plan for us to have someone to follow? to have a leader, to have someone be there as an example for us. And the answer is in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, in his farewell khutbah, now you have to imagine for a lot of the people at that time, this is the last time that they were going to see the Prophet ﷺ. This is the last message that they're going to hear from him, from his own words. So obviously the farewell pilgrimage is very important. And what the Prophet ﷺ says, at the farewell pil pilgrimage is very, very important. And from amongst what he said, he said, Taraktu fikum amrei. He says, I have left you with two things, or two, th uh, two matters. He said, Lam ma bihima. He said, as long as you hold on to these two things, you will not go astray. He said, Kitabullahi wa sunnat nabihi He said, that is the book of Allah, and the sunnah of the Prophet And as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected this message until the day of judgment. And from this message we say, the Qur'an and the sunnah is preserved and protected for us. So, we have someone to follow. We have someone to look up to until the day of judgment. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said about the Prophet وسلم, reminding us, now listen, this is the person you should follow. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That there has been for you in the Messenger of Allah a prime example, the best example, the best of examples. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْضُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخَرُ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخَرُ That the person or the one who hopes in Allah and the final day. Meaning if that is what you want and that's truly what your aqidah is, that's what your belief is, that indeed you want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And as we know, that's one of the greatest blessings that a Muslim will ever, ever come across. And that would be the happiest moment we will ever have experienced is seeing the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we hope to meet Allah, and we believe in the final day, right, we believe that we're going to be accountable for our actions, in that case, then the Prophet ﷺ is the best of your examples. However if, you, however, if you don't believe that, if you don't believe that you're going to be held accountable for your actions, then go ahead and follow Katy Perry or Justin Bieber or whoever you want, right? No big deal. If you don't believe that you're held accountable for your actions, if you, if you believe that, listen, the only purpose of my life is just to have fun and to do things and whatever is enjoyable to me, I'll do that. If that is your, what your aqidah is, if that is what your, what your faith is, then go ahead and follow whoever you, you want. However, 
if you believe that you will show up on the Day of Judgment and you will be accountable for your actions, then the Prophet ﷺ is the best of examples that you have. And this is something that the companions of Allah this is something that they understood. And this is something we see which was part of their lives. And it's very interesting how, like the stories of the companions and, and who they actually were. If you look at the companions, they were normal human beings. They were human beings, they weren't superhuman. They made mistakes and even at times they even committed sins. However, the Prophet ﷺ called them khayrul qurun. He said they are the best of generations. He said khayrul qurun qarini. Right? The best of generations is my generation. Meaning the generation of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So what really made the companions the best of generations? As we said, they, weren't, they were human beings like us. Right? They had strengths and weaknesses and emotions and feelings and all that kind of stuff. But what made them in particular the best of generations? Firstly, they gave importance to the sunnah, to the commandments of the Prophet ﷺ above everything else. Above everything else they gave importance or they gave preference to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And even we see the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا تؤمنوا أحدكم He said, none of you will truly believe until your desires conform to that which I have brought. Meaning, our desires may at times pull us away from the sunnah of the Prophet so I said that. So sometimes we may know this is the sunnah, this is the commandment of Allah, this is what we're supposed to be doing. However, our desires pull us in a different direction. And the Prophet says, in order for you to truly have iman, in order for you to have true iman, your desires have to conform to that which I have brought being the message of Islam. And this is why, subhanAllah, we see that Islam is a basically a call against succumbing to our desires. And if you think like if you if you if you uh, see religions or, or ways of life like atheism, for example, it's the exact opposite. Atheism calls you to follow your desires. Right? And you know what they say is if it feels good, what? If it feels good, do it. If it doesn't, then don't do it. Right? And that is, that is like a way of life. And that is how, like an atheist for example, their test of right and wrong is basically, do I think this is right or wrong? Right? And the problem with something like that is, in the end of the day, every person has their own desires. And every person has their own wants and needs and all of this stuff. And if you leave it up to the individual, right? Say, listen, if you feel like this is good, then go ahead and do it. If it feels good to you, Go ahead and do it. You're going to have a society which is chaotic. There's chaos in the society. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands this. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is a uh, story of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When Umar was the Khalifa. And Umar gave a judgment in which he said that the widow of a man who had passed away she does not receive anything from the blood money of her husband, the husband who's passed away. And another companion, al tahakim Sufyan, he came to Umar and he said, I personally received a letter from the Prophet ﷺ, in which the Prophet ﷺ told me that the widow receives money or she receives from the amount given in the blood money. So somebody's husband has passed away, somebody's husband is killed or something like that, and there's blood money given for the husband that the widower receives that money, even though Umar had initially said otherwise. And as soon as Umar heard that, as soon as he heard that this is what the Prophet had instructed, he immediately changed his answer. And he reverted to what the Prophet said. And this shows you how subhanAllah, the, the, uh, how Umar he gave preference to the sunnah over even his own ego, right? And you have to realize who Umar was at this time. He wasn't just like an ordinary person. He was the Khalifa, right? People look up to him. He's like the ruler of the Muslim Ummah. And he immediately changed his judgment. He immediately changed his ruling, right? And a lot of times, uh, one of the problems that we face, for example, is uh, because of the internet and stuff like that, people argue online. And I've personally seen uh, many like debates and things like that. Uh, online, you might have experienced it as well, where somebody posts something controversial or not even, and then you see people replying and going back and forth and arguing back and forth and back and forth. So, Pamela, one time I even like I was on my Facebook page, and uh, not my Facebook page, I was on my um, my Facebook feed, 
And I saw an argument taking place between, it was just two or three people. And it said, click here to view the previous 246 comments. And I was like, subhanAllah, this argument occurred where people went back and forth 246 times. Right? And what happens a lot of times in these arguments is that because it's usually a matter of our ego, right? we want to prove somebody wrong, we want to make sure that we are saying that we are right. right? We don't want to look bad because a lot of times when arguments occur on the internet, right? if they're, incur they're occurring in front of a lot of people, our friends can see it. The person who we're arguing with, their friends can see it. Other people can see it. We don't want to look bad. So a lot of times we may even say something which is incorrect. Or we may start speaking about Islam without knowledge because we want to prove ourselves to be correct. And we see Umar when he was the Khalifa, he was the, he was the leader of the Muslim Ummah. In that position, he gave preference to the Sunnah. And he said, listen, it's not about my ego. It's not about proving that I'm right. It's about going back to the Sunnah of the Prophet So that's the first thing. That's one of the things that made the companions the best of generations, that they always put the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ before everything else, even their own desires, and even their own ego, or even their own, like, trying to look nice or look good in front of someone. Secondly, the companions, the second thing that made them the best of generations, is that they didn't hesitate or wait to implement the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So it wasn't like, you know, you hear something, this is the sunnah of Prophet the Prophet instructed us to do this, or this is what Islam tells us to do, and we sit and we ponder over it for a while. And say, you know, can I really do this? This is something really hard, something I find really difficult, etc., etc. When the companions got a commandment from the Prophet when they saw a sunnah of the Prophet they immediately implemented it, and they immediately acted upon it. And this is why we know that in Medina, when the judgment finally came, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally made alcohol haram, alcohol was made impermissible, the Prophet sent a companion out in the streets of Medina to tell the people that intoxicants, that alcohol has now become haram, has become impermissible. And there's narrations that say that companions, they were, they had some of them, they were drinking alcohol, it was, it was in their mouth and they spat it out. And by the way, alcohol was something beloved to the Arabs at that time. It was a big part of society, right? Along with that, that's how they reacted when, they, when, they, uh, when the commandment came down. And we know this narration, even that mentioned that the, the streets of Medina, the, the alcohol was poured out in the streets. And then some houses, you could hear the, the glasses and the, and the vessels that contained alcohol, you could hear them breaking. And this was an immediate thing. Something which was so beloved to them, they immediately left it because it, the command came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's many, many other stories, uh, one time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is narrated uh, in the Muslim of, of Imam Ahmed, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was praying, he was leading the companions in prayer, and during his prayer, he took off his shoes or his sandals. And when he did this, the whole congregation, now I want you to imagine this, like, I want you to picture this happening. Imagine you're praying in the masjid, and the imam does something, and the whole congregation takes off their shoes. And then the Prophet said, I'm after Salah, he asked them, he says, why did you take your shoes off? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, we did it because we saw you doing it. Meaning it was that immediate, they didn't even think about it, it wasn't even like a, like what is happening, what should we do, whatever, like the Prophet said I was doing it, we do it. And then the Prophet said, I only took them off because Jibreel came to me, he told me that I had some filth, or some najasa on my shoes, and that's why I took them off. He said otherwise I would not have uh, taken them off. Uh, Ibn Umar which is by the way a companion, known to be like very strong upon the sunnah of the Prophet said. You know, subhanAllah, I wish that I could have that title. Right? Because that's such an honorable title to have. And when you remember the Sahabi, you think of him as like the person who was strong upon the Sunnah of the Prophet. To, to the point where the other companions they would say about him that if you see Ibn Umar doing something, know that he got it from the Prophet. Know that he saw the Prophet doing it and that's why he's doing it. Right? That's who Ibn Umar was. Ibn Umar tells us, he says that the Prophet at one point in his life, and this mentioned in Sahih al Bukhari, he said the Prophet he started wearing a gold ring. And as soon as this happened, the companions immediately put on a gold ring. And then a lot of loads of companions started wearing gold rings. And then the Prophet wasallam, he asked the people, he asked, he said, why are you wearing gold rings? They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we saw you wearing a gold ring. And then the Prophet immediately took it off and discarded it and said, I will never wear a gold ring. And as we know, for men it is impermissible uh, to wear gold in Islam. Uh, those are just some examples. There's a very st uh, famous statement by uh, Abu Bakr. 
He said about himself, he said, I have never ever left anything that the Prophet وسلم, used to do, except that I acted upon it. Meaning he could not think of a single sunnah that he was aware of, that the Prophet did, that he didn't do. Right? He said, there's not a single thing that I know. And that's palace, that's another honor, that's, that's like not another honor to have. Like who amongst us can say about ourselves that I've done every sunnah of the Prophet he said about himself, he said, I, there's not a single sunnah except that I've implemented it, I've acted upon it. He says, because I fear that if I don't do that, I may become misguided. That was the mentality of the companions. That's how they viewed the sunnah of the Prophet It wasn't about, yeah, can I do this? Or is this something that I'm able to do? Or will this be easy for me to do? Or the, the, the famous question that gets asked, subhanAllah, and I personally received this question many times, is when somebody says to me, uh, is this sunnah or is it fun? Like, do you have to do this? And even worse, kind of one of my least favorite questions, least favorite questions, is how haram is this? <laughs> Seriously, how haram is this? It doesn't matter how haram it is, it's haram, period, done. We're over with this conversation. That's why I hate receiving that question. Number three. So we said, number one, the companion of the Allah Anhum, that they always gave preference to the sunnah above everything else. Secondly, the companions never waited or hesitated to implement the sunnah of the Prophet said them. Number three, and this is very interesting, and I want you to pay attention to this. The companions, not only did they follow the sunnah, not only did they obey the sunnah, they loved the sunnah. And you may be asking, what's the difference? And I'll tell you what the difference is. At times, we may fulfill a command. So we know something is haram, so we don't do it. Or we know something is wajib upon us, something is fuck upon us, something mandatory. We have to do it, so we do it. But the issue is, in our hearts, do we love doing this action because it's the sunnah or not? And subhanAllah, I had one brother come up to me. Obviously, I'm not going to say who it is. But they said to me, they said, you know, this is a brother who had started practicing Islam, and, uh, you know, they weren't very religious before. So he said to me, he said, uh, he said you know, I've left uh, smoking marijuana. He said, I've left it, alhamdulillah, I don't do that anymore. He said, and then he said to me, he said, you know, this is something that I really used to love. And he says, I hope that in Jannah it's, it's permissible to smoke marijuana. <laughs> and I said, SubhanAllah, your, your heart is still attached to this sin. And that is something that the companions, they, they totally got rid of that. As soon as they understood that something is impermissible or something was not the sunnah, they immediately detached their hearts from it. And this is something which is like a, it's like a, it's like a small drift, like you may not exactly realize when this happens, but at times we may leave a sin, but our hearts may still be attached to that sin. And we may say to ourselves, you know, if I wasn't Muslim, I'd probably do that. And I've heard even brothers say to me, for example, about tattoos. You know, tattoos are really in these days. Everyone and their mother is getting a tattoo. Uh, I heard one person say, they said, you know, tattoos are so cool. Uh, if there weren't haram Islam, I would definitely have a tattoo. There is a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made tattoos haram. Now, this is why I want to give you some ways to love the sunnah of Islam. So when you find yourself in that position, when you find yourself in a place where you're like, you've left this sin maybe, but your heart is still attached to the sin, here are three things that you can do. Make sure you write these down. How many people have notebooks here, by the way? How many people are writing down stuff? Mashallah. Okay. Three things that you can do to develop that love for something that is a commandment. Number one, understand that things are legislated for our own benefit. So if something is sunnah to do, in the end of the day it's beneficial for us and it's good for us. If something is haram or something is not good for us to do, then realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that it's not good for us to do that. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it haram. And when you think about that, and you realize that issue, then it will help you detach your heart from this sin. That's number one. Number two, realize that when you love the sunnah of the Prophet you are loving the best of mankind. The best of creation. A lot of times we, we may adopt certain like uh, things based off of like celebrities or people who are famous and stuff like that. And we, don't, we do so because we think this person is so cool or they're so awesome or whatever, whatever. Realize that the Prophet is the most awesome <laughs> out of all of these people. 
no matter what celebrity you think is how cool or whatever, or whatever you think about them, they're so stylish or they're this or they're good looking or whatever it is about them, realize that the Prophet Sallam is better. And so when you follow the sunnah of the Prophet you're following the sunnah of somebody who's way better than any of these people you have around you. Number three, the third thing you can do is realize that on the day of judgment, if you have followed the sunnah of the Prophet Sallam, you'll be the coolest cat ever. Right? Nobody will be cooler than you if you were upon the sunnah of the Prophet Now, that is important to note because somebody may abandon the sunnah of the Prophet They may leave the sunnah of the Prophet in this life and they may be considered cool or whatever, or hip, or they may have swag because of that. But realize that this dunya is very short. So let's say this person was cool for his whole life, but they didn't have the sunnah of the Prophet so maybe they were cool for like 80 years. I mean, people don't usually live past 80, 90, whatever. Let's say 100 the most. This person was cool for 100 years. A person who is cool on the day of judgment will be cool for at least 50,000 years. As we know, the day of judgment is 50,000 years long. And on that day, a person will be so happy that they follow the sunnah of the Prophet And they'll say, you know, no matter what people thought of me in life, that was such a short period of time that I barely even remember it. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the person who goes through uh, an, an intense moment of regret on the day of judgment. On the day when the, the zalim, the oppressor, they bite their hands out of regret. Why? He will say that, I wish I had taken a path with the, with the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa I wish I had taken a path with him. I wish I had followed the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then he would say, Ya wa'ila ta'i. He would say, Woe be to me. Ya laytani lam attakhid fulan al I wish I had not taken so and so as a close friend. Somebody who I thought was cool, for example, or somebody I thought, you know, I, I need to be close to this person because I need to be famous, I need to be in, I need to be whatever it is and you leave the sunnah of the Prophet this person will regret that moment on the day of judgment and say, I wish I hadn't taken so and so, taken so and so as my close friend. This person misguided me, they took me away from the dhikr, from the right path, from Islam, after it had already come to me. After I was already Muslim, I understood what Islam is. I understood, as we as Muslims understand, that we will be accountable for our deeds that the sunnah of Prophet is the best sunnah to follow, is the best trend to follow. After we already knew this, we took somebody as a close friend and they took us away from the sunnah of the Prophet So these are three things that we can do to implement loving the sunnah of the Prophet because that really is the completion of loving the Prophet and loving the sunnah and following the sunnah. It's one thing to you know follow the sunnah, it's another thing to follow the sunnah of the Prophet and also love it. But like I said before, we have within us the desire to follow trends or follow somebody and fit in, be part of be, be part of something bigger than us. And this is why it's kind of like in our times, like like I said before, you see people following or doing the most ridiculous things ever. For example, uh, the Harlem Shake. You guys know what the Harlem Shake is? Yeah. People are like, no, we don't know what the Harlem Shake is. The Harlem Shake, if you were to take it out of context, if you were to see the, the Harlem Shake, uh, let's say five years ago, or 10 years ago, or let's say like 20 years in the future, people would be like, what is wrong with these people? Are they absolutely nuts? Why are they doing this? This is ridiculous. It's the most ridiculous thing ever. However, people accept it now because it's in. It's the popular thing to do. It's a trend everyone's catching on. It's the cool thing to do. But usually, like, like I said, 10 years ago, people were like, what is this? If you take it out of that context, but because we believe that everyone's doing it, we believe it's the cool thing to do, just to fit in, we're like, we should do it as well. And there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, for example, one of my least favorite words, although I use this a lot in my talks, the word swag, or saying somebody has swag. That's the most ridiculous thing ever, to say somebody has swag. Now, or like the swag look or whatever. This is something that I guarantee you, and I remember as kind of uh, before I went to Medina, before I went to Medina was study, which is about almost uh, eight or nine years ago, fashion and, and trends were very different back then. And I often think, I think to myself, I say, subhanAllah, if we took like the swag look or whatever, and we took it back to that time, if somebody looked like that back then, like he'd be like beat up in high school or something. Right? 
right, with those super tight pants and like the big glasses and like the hipsters. You know what I'm talking about? Like that would not be cool at all. But because it's in the context where we're like, you know, this is what's in, because we want to fit in, we tend to follow it. And that is, that is the nature of trends. And the problem with that is almost always, like these type of trends, people almost always regret them. So this is why people, like you may even have parents who are, let's say if you had parents who were like fashionable or whatever, back in the day, and they have old pictures, they'll look at their old pictures and be like, I was looking at that, like I can't believe I did that. Like why would, I, why would I dress like that or whatever? People almost always regret trends. They almost regret the looking the way they looked before. The sunnah of Prophet is something that you will never regret. Never, ever, ever will you regret following the sunnah of Prophet More importantly, on the day of judgment, like I said, you'll be delighted that you follow the sunnah of Prophet You will be delighted that you took a path with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the sunnah of Prophet is everlasting, unlike these trends. These trends, they, they're in and out. So one day it's in, the next day it's it's old, like nobody's doing it anymore. SubhanAllah, even somebody, uh, recently I, I was reading on Facebook, somebody said that, uh, somebody posted a Harlem Shake video. It's almost like, that's so last month, like who is doing that now? And I was like, SubhanAllah, all of a sudden it's uncool now, it's been less than a month. The Sunnah of the Prophet is everlasting. It'll be cool until the Day of Judgment and beyond. So if a person adopts the sunnah, and that becomes their identity, like I said, the identity of Ibn Umar, for example, where people are like, this is the person who's on the sunnah. Like he, he basically embodied how the Prophet looked and acted and talked, etc., etc. That's, that's the type of identity that we want for ourselves. Also, not only is the sunnah of the Prophet everlasting, there is true honor in the sunnah of the Prophet Unlike any type of honor we may get from people by following other trends. And there's a famous story of uh, Umar radiallahu When Umar was a Khalifa, he was traveling to Asham with Abu Ubaidah And Umar, he, they, they, Abu Ubaidah and Umar, they came across a deep creek. And they were riding on, like a, on, a, on a camel. So Umar radiallahu he gets off of his camel. Now mind you, they're on their way to Sham. He gets off of his camel, he takes off his shoes and he puts them on his shoulder. And then he grabs the reins of the camel and he drags the camel, takes the camel through the water. Now Abu Ubaidah, he says to Umar, he says, he says uh, you know, the people won't think good of you. Or they won't think you're very honorable, like you're supposed to be the Khalifa of the Muslim Ummah. And you have, you have like your shoes on your, soul, on, on your shoulder and you're, you know, you're dragging the camel. You're helping, you're helping the camel through instead of the camel helping you through the water. And Umar, it's very interesting what he says to him. He says, first of all, he says, I wish somebody else had said this but you. Meaning, you, Abu Ubaidah, who's knowledgeable, who's a companion, who has the understanding of, of what we're all about, I, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that I hear this from you. Then he says to him, his famous lines, lines. he says, He said, we are a nation, we are a people that have been given honor because of our Islam. He said, the moment we try to seek izzah or honor in anything but Islam, Allah will humiliate us. True honor lies in the sunnah, in Islam, in following Islam. And this is something that we may not understand on an individual level. But on a grander, on a large scale picture, we see this actually happening. That the more we try to imitate other people and be like other people, we see the Muslim ummah uh, loses more and more honor and more and more uh, izzah. And we see this happen. The further away we get from Islam, the further away we get from having honor. And this is why I said the companions were the best of generation, because they understood that fact. That true honor, true izzah lies in the sunnah of Prophet It lies in following Islam. Now, the question that you may be asking yourself now is, Alhamdulillah, you told us about the sunnah of Prophet and how we should follow the sunnah, and that should be our trend, and that's what we should be doing. How do we actually go about following the sunnah? What do we do? Now, I'll tell you what to do. Most people, when they look at us and they want to see what we're all about, they judge us by a couple different things. Number one is how we look. So that's the first possible thing. So you can look at somebody and you, you can say what they're all about. Uh, people often look at me and the first thing they notice about me is my convert Chucks. And they say something about Chucks. Like, like that's who you are. And I'm actually kind of sad that that's how people identify, and identify me now. But the reality is that people will look at you and the first judgment that they're going to make is based off of your looks, how you're dressed, how you are physically. 
Now, this is the first step to following the Sunnah of Prophet Make sure that with the way you look, your physical appearance matches up with the requirements of the Sharia, matches up with Islam. Now, I'm not saying that everyone has to be a carbon copy of each other. And don't get me wrong, I know, I know, I know uh, this is what a lot of people think, that if we implement the Sunnah, every single person is going to look exactly the same. Every brother's going to have a beard, they're going to wear a thobe, da -da -da -da, a white thobe with a pen, like they're going to look exactly the same, right? That's not what we're saying. Uh, or every sister will be wearing black head to toe, and that's how everyone will look. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is that make sure the way you dress, the way you are physically, fits inside the boundaries of the Sharia. Islam has given us boundaries, and the rest is up to us. And I understand that people have the the uh, the desire to express themselves, to be an individual. I get that. So what we're saying here is just keep in mind the requirements of Sharia of the Sharia. So, for example, one of the requirements is that we should dress modestly. So as long as we're dressing modestly, that's one requirement. Or as long as we're not like exposing any skin or stuff like that, those are some of the requirements of the Sharia. As long as we can fit that into our requirements, then dress. We go and dress and try to fulfill the Sunnah of the Prophet Number two, people judge you or people will look at you, they can tell what you're all about by what you say, the way you talk. So the second thing usually is, so if somebody looks at you and for the first thing they tell about you is, okay, this is the way this person looks, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, this is how this person talks. So when we hear them talking, this is what we know about them. And this subhanAllah is why I think we need, a lot of us need a lot of work. Watching our tongues and, and, and thinking about being conscious of what comes out of our mouth. And the Prophet said him, Anas radiallahu anhu, as you mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, that the Prophet said him, was never a person who is uh, fahishan, the Prophet was never somebody who abused others, nor did he have a bad, a foul tongue, nor did he ever curse anyone. This is the sunnah of the Prophet that the tongue of the Prophet was pure. The way he talked to people was pure. Even like the worst of people, the Prophet had the best of characters in the way the Prophet spoke to them. So if we want to be on the sunnah of the Prophet we have to watch our tongues and ask ourselves the question, is my tongue following the sunnah or not? Uh, thirdly, People judge us by our morals. So now somebody's looked at us, they've heard us speak, then they'll start asking us questions and trying to get us know, trying to get us know, trying to get to know us more. And when they try to ask us more questions, they will begin to see where our moral compass lies. So how do you judge right from wrong? As we said, an atheist, for example, may judge right and wrong based off of what they think is right or wrong. They'll be like, this is moral, this is immoral. Somebody who's upon the sunnah their judge of right and wrong will be the commandments of Allah. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their Lord and their creator has said about what is right and wrong. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is right, this is okay, we say this is okay. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this is wrong, then we say it's wrong. And if we have that type of moral compass, then we are upon the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, number four, the fourth thing people judge about us now let's get a little bit more deeper, is our spirituality. How spiritual are we? Basically what we mean is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How spiritual are we? Uh, how religious are we in terms of how much we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The issue of, of praying and fasting and family laid and all those types of things, those are things that make up our spirituality, our dhikr of Allah. So if we want to be on the sunnah, our dhikr and our salah and our zakah and our fasting and all this kind of stuff, it has to match up with the sunnah of the Prophet or we should at least try our best to be upon that level. Also, and I would say maybe this even comes before spirituality, how we treat others, how we interact with others. So immediately, when people met the Prophet Sallam, they knew there was something amazing about him. Just by the way the Prophet Sallam acted around people. And this is why the Prophet Sallam told us, he said, I've been sent to perfect good character. What is character? Character, part of character is how you treat people, how you act with people, what you do around people. And the more power, the more you read about the Prophet, the more you hear about the Prophet, you realize he had impeccable character. That when he dealt with people, he was the most amazing person. And some people accepted Islam simply because they were so impressed by the character of the Prophet. Do people look at us and say, mashallah, or like, or not mashallah, say like a non-Muslim, they look at us and they meet us and say, you know, this person, he has such good character. Or such a nice, kind person. That is the sunnah of the Prophet So if you want to ask yourself and say, listen, am I following the sunnah? Meaning, will somebody meet me and immediately feel comfortable around me? Will they feel impressed? Will they be like, 
this person is different than everyone else in society. Everyone else in society, for example, is worried about themselves, taking care of themselves. But a Muslim is worried about others as well. They take care of others, they're kind and they're gentle, and they, they help others. This was the character of the Even like, if you look at how the dealt with different people in society, like the rich versus the poor, the Prophet was fair with both of them. If you look at how the Prophet dealt with the old versus the young, it's amazing. The, obviously, the Prophet gave respect to the elders, but even the way the Prophet treated like the younger generation. Like, and I'm not, when I mean younger generation, I mean like five and under. A man saw the Prophet kissing Hassan Hussain, and he said, he said, Ya Rasulullah, he said, you, you kiss these two. And he said, he said, I in my whole life have never kissed my children. And the Prophet said, I mean, he got upset. He said, Man la yarham la yarham. He, said, he said, the person who doesn't show mercy to others will not be shown mercy to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So this is how the Prophet was with kids. And I can actually spend like hours talking about how the Prophet was simply how he was with kids and how amazing his character was with kids alone. But that was the sunnah of the Prophet. And very importantly, how the Prophet treated his enemies. The people who hated the Prophet, the people who wanted to kill the Prophet, the people who wanted to destroy Islam, even with them, the Prophet had good character. He spoke to them kindly. He didn't like curse at them because they were their enemy. He didn't have a foul tongue, as we said. He was gentle, he was kind, he, was, he, was, he had good character when he spoke with these people. If we want to be upon the Sunnah of Prophet, those, that's the type of character that we need to have for ourselves. Lastly, people will judge us by the way we treat ourselves. And, that, and what I mean by that is how we take care of ourselves. Are we conscious about the way we are with ourselves? For example, even things like our body and things like that. Do we, do we say that, you know what, SubhanAllah, this body that I have, this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm supposed to take care of it. How I am with myself, my health, etc., etc. And I know like a lot of people, like when they're young, uh, we have a tendency to just like say, you know what, it's no problem, I can abuse my body for a while and it'll be okay. And this is why you find uh, most people start smoking, for example, when they're young. It's, it's rare, I mean it happens sometimes, but it's rare that somebody starts smoking when they're old. Because the older you get, the more you realize that yeah, death is coming. But as a young person, you feel like, you feel like you're never going to die. Or, or a person may light up a cigarette and say, you know what, what's, what's some cigarettes going to do to me? Like my body will be fine. And this is ignoring the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take away our life at any time. So respecting your body and respecting yourself as well. So if we want to be on the sunnah, we take all these things and we try to implement them in our lives. The last uh, thought I'll leave you with, and I apologize to the Shaykh for taking uh, his time. Um, the last thing I want to leave, uh, leave you with is some practical things that you can do to uh, begin to be upon the sunnah of Prophet and how to, how to, how to uh, get to know the Prophet uh, even more. Number one, and I cannot stress this enough, is study the seerah of the Prophet And when I, when I say study, I don't necessarily mean read, because I know like, our generation just doesn't read. A lot of people don't read. Uh, there's other resources, alhamdulillah, there's like the video lectures, etc., etc., there's audio lectures. Whatever way you can go and find out about, the, obviously from authentic sources, but finding out about the life of the Prophet and learning how the Prophet actually was, and what his life was like, that will help you develop love for the Prophet and help you, it'll just make you want to be more like the Prophet A lot of people's found they didn't even know like the, what happened in the life of the Prophet They, uh, us as Muslims a lot of times, like, yeah, we have a Prophet, the final Prophet, Muhammad that's great. What actually was the life of the Prophet about? How did the message of Islam start? Like, what happened in his life? Why do we consider him the best of creation? Like, do we know the answers to these questions? So what we need to find out. Secondly, uh, and this is like more like an in-depth thing, is where you begin to actually study books of hadith. Because a seer, the seerah of the Prophet may give you like a general picture or an overview of the life of the Prophet When you start studying books of hadith, you start learning like small details about the Prophet And I can tell you that every time, me personally, I've ever picked up a book of hadith, it has only increased me in love for the Prophet It has only pushed me to say, you know, I want to be more like that. When you learn small things, so when you hear uh, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha tell you some like small detail about the Prophet it just makes you fall in love with the Prophet And that a lot of times, it, won't, it might not come from books of Sirah, it'll come from books of Hadith. So you, if you say like Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, books like that, where you get to hear like, intrig like small detailed things about the Prophet Lastly, get to know those people who love the Prophet more than anyone else. The 
companions رضي الله تعالى عنه. Get to know who they were and get to uh, find, just like you, know, you study the seed of the study the lives of the companions. Go learn about the companions and what was special about them, what made them, as we said, the best of generations of love that they had for the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهدوا لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وتبريك جزاك الله خير